Father, thank you. Thank you for that grace that you extended to us sinners. Thank you for the fact that we became a child of God because Jesus went to the cross and bought us. You are an awesome God. And we've come today to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for letting us, letting us be your representatives here on earth in this 21st century. Thank you for trusting us to share that message of Jesus Christ that went to the cross, paid for this old sinner's sins. Not that he deserved it, but you love me that much and each of us. No wonder we get excited about singing the music, the songs. No wonder we get excited about coming to church. No wonder we get excited about telling the story. No wonder we get excited about sharing the message. Because it's a personal message. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Trish. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, today to the book of Nehemiah in your Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses or the first chapter of Nehemiah. While you're turning there, I just want to remind you that God is working in Hillsford Church. He's moving. Rex Meehan just went back past week and had another scan and he is 80%. His cancer is 80% gone. Amen. Amen. And he'll be going back again uh, in, in uh, three months to uh, have another scan. So, so keep praying. Judy, when they checked hers, it found out it was just a little bitty speck, right? Just a little bitty speck. And you know what? God, is a, God can heal a speck. <laughs> he can heal it. You know what? God likes little things. I think that's why he called me. <laughs> so God is moving. Don't ever think that he's not. We've titled our message today. We've titled our message today, Nehemiah's Dilemma. Have you ever had a dilemma? I think from time to time we all have had. Sometimes some of us has more than, uh, more than others. Uh, sometimes the dilemma is just brought upon us like the one brought upon Nehemiah. Sometimes it's self-inflicted as well. But anyway, we're going to look today at Nehemiah's dilemma and how he handled it, how he dealt with it. First, I want to introduce you to Nehemiah. Oh, I know you know him. You've read his book probably more than one time. A fairly short book if you want, uh, if you want to read a book in the Bible. All of them excite you, but Nehemiah's a good one. Uh, just a few chapters and <clears throat> you'll enjoy reading that. But Nehemiah was an Israeli. His, his father, matter of fact, we know very little about him except his father's uh, name was uh, Hekeliah. And we know nothing about him other than they were, uh, they were uh, of the children of Israel, probably of the tribe of Judah. I know that may not mean a lot to you, but, uh, uh, and I'm going to do some Holostonian uh, theology today as well. Uh, they, they, uh, they went to the church at Jerusalem, and, and that was Nehemiah and his family's church. He, they loved God. And, and then because of the sins of the people, because of the sins of the people, uh, and they disobeyed God, and then God allowed a, a pagan nation to come through and they just completely destroyed Nebuchadnezzar and his army and carried them off into, uh, into Babylonian and uh, just completely destroyed the temple, tore down the fence around the Jerusalem and the gates around Jerusalem and uh, just completely devastated that area. Nehemiah was one of the captives that was carried into Babylonian. Nehemiah uh, got a job, or at least was appointed a job, uh, there in the palace of the king, uh, Artaxerxes. 
uh, as his wine taster. It was, a, it was a royal job in the royal palace. Nehemiah was a wine taster. And Nehemiah uh, had, a, uh, had a personality that it was easy to get to like him. Because this, this book reminds us that Nehemiah often sat with the king. And he would taste his wine before the king would drink it to make sure it wasn't poison. And even it identified him that he would sit with the king at times when, uh, when, uh, when his wife was present with him. So Nehemiah was a likable person. Nehemiah loved God. Nehemiah loved his church back at Jerusalem, the temple. And now he was about a thousand miles away in a, some type of captivity, uh, maybe more of a house arrest, his was. But anyway, a word came to him one day uh, that, that things wasn't like they should have been. Back at Jerusalem, the temple was torn down, the gates were torn down, and Nehemiah just, he just broke down as a result, as a result of that. He knew that, that he knew that, that he wanted to go back and help the people, but he worked in the palace. He worked with the king and probably kind of dreaded even mentioning that to the king. And we're going to read about that in our scriptures. So that's who Nehemiah was. But what was Nehemiah's dilemma? What was his dilemma? dilemma? It was that, 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 that his church, Jerusalem, the temple, uh, the people that were left after, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after Nebuchadnezzar came through and, and, and ruined the city and carried a lot of the people captive, he got word that, that, that the people were depressed and that the people uh, were, 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 were struggling. And it broke his heart. It broke his heart. His dilemma was not self-perceived. His dilemma just came up on him by, by the results of someone else. And that's kind of the way dilemmas would happen. So Nehemiah had a solution. And he printed that solution in this very first chapter of Nehemiah. So if you all haven't already, turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah, the first chapter. And we're going to be reading at least portions uh, of that chapter, and which contains 11 verses. The very first verse, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chisla, and we're told by uh, commentators that that was probably mid-November our time and, and, and December. In the 20th year, as I was in Shusha, the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, now, all of the commentaries that I, uh, I studied uh, said that this was uh, Nehemiah's brother, blood brother. But whenever I read brothering, I think it's indicating all of his brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I'm not going to argue with the commentators. It's not a big deal. But I kind of felt like it was, uh, was more of his brothering in Christ. But anyway, Hananiah, one of my brethren, came... He and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And he got the answer, and they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captives there in the providence are of great affliction and reproach. Reproach simply means uh, that, that they... Uh, that they were de degraced, put down. The walls of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. When Nehemiah heard those words, here's what happened. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Here we see a man, a man that is so concerned about his church that when he got word that things wasn't going so well, he broke down. He cried. He cried. Now, if some of you men sitting out there is thinking that, that the old story that used, used to come through our lines that men don't cry, 
Well, that's wrong. I think the only men that don't cry are those that hearts are hardened. Nehemiah had a soft heart. He was concerned about somebody living a thousand miles away. He was concerned about the status of his church there in Jerusalem, the temple incidentally. He was concerned about that. He was concerned about the people. He was concerned about the fence around Jerusalem that were to be protective. He was concerned about the gates being torn down. And here he was, a thousand miles away, living really a good life, had a good job, was friends with his boss, and people seemed to love him and care for him. Now, before we read any further, I want to make sure I don't, we don't lose that particular thought. What Nehemiah could have said, what he could have said when he got the news, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my people are suffering. I'm sorry that the church has been destroyed. I'm sorry that the fence is down. I'm sorry that there are no gates. I'll be praying for you. And went on about his business. He could have done that. He could have done that. I have found myself in that place from time to time. That people, when they come through the door at the end of service, would say, preacher or pastor, I want you to pray for so-and-so. Yeah, I'll pray. But by the time all of us gets out, and if it hadn't been written down, I have forgotten that. And I wind up not praying. So I'm saying that for two reasons. One It's wrong to tell somebody that you'll pray for them and then you don't. And number two, whenever you come through the door and you want want me to pray for somebody and I love those requests, get something out of the back of the bulletin and write the names down and hand that to me and I'll guarantee you I won't forget it. Nehemiah could have said that. He could have said, I'm, I'm a thousand miles away. I've got a job and nothing that I could do about that. But he did not say that. After getting that word, after having his, and the, and the, and the commentaries talk like these were months of, of crying and weeping and praying. Well, let me just back up a little bit and pick up that verse. Uh, as he prayed and mourned certain days, he fasted. He fasted. When was the last time your pastor fasted? For, a, for, for, for something that, that he was concerned enough about. To, to lay something aside and focus on that individual thing. When was the last time you fasted for a cause? That's biblical. That is biblical. Nehemiah fasted. It doesn't tell us how long he fasted. He fasted. And he, he prayed before the God of heaven. Let me challenge us here just for a moment. The cry of Christ team has challenged us to pray for the, for the cry of Christ for the next 30 days. And then if it hadn't come to that time, they'll give us another sheet. But let me encourage you, take that sheet and put it somewhere and, and read whatever they're suggesting that we pray about. Because, you know, that's who we are. We pray for other people. We pray for ourselves, but we also pray for other people, and that is supporting other people. Nehemiah was supporting these folks that were a thousand miles away. And you and I are to support each other. And, and I meant what I said a while ago. God is doing some good work in Hillsford Church. Although we're a church that's full of sinners, saved by grace, God is still doing a work here. And he's counting on you and I to carry that work out. He's counting on you and I to complete his mission here at Hell's Forward. And that cry of Christ is a great outreach program. But more than that, from this pastor's eyes, it's a great in-reach program. 
I love to watch our people getting ready for that and uh, spending time with each other and, and laughing and talking and being serious when we're supposed to be serious. So let's pray for that. Let's pray that God will work a number through that on Hillsford Church and then we'll reach out and touch some others as well. We'll reach out and touch some others as well. So let's complete our reading here just, just very quickly. Verse 5, and said, he, he prayed. Nehemiah prayed. He was a man that was used to talking to God. He was a man that was used to taking his dilemmas to God, knowing that God is a dilemma. Solver, thank you. <laughs> a dilemma solver. What is your dilemma today? I'm sure there are some in here. And God wants to solve them. You know what makes us get discouraged sometimes? is when God don't respond by our timetable. We get very discouraged. These people had been, had been captive now for a number of years. And it was time now for God to bring them back home as he promised. We'll pick that scripture up a little bit later. Verse 6, let your ears be attentive and, and your eyes open that I may hear, that you may hear the prayers of your servant which I pray before you today and night. And the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house. You know what the worst sin, the worst sin that there is in our lives? And we're sinners saved by grace. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that we can do anything we want to and, and, and it's okay with God. Sin is not okay with God. Not ever okay with God. Whether it's you or whether it's me, it's never okay with God. But the worst sin that we can commit, I want you to listen, you're hearing it here first. The worst sin that we can commit is those unconfessed sins. Those unconfessed sins, those are the worst sins that we can commit. God knows that we're sinners. He knows that we're in that carnal body. He wants to heal us from those sins. That's why Jesus died for our sins, that we might have a relationship with God. That we might have a relationship with God. Let me pick up a couple other verses, and then we'll, we'll get to the outline. Let's hop on down to verse 8 and 9. Verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee, the words that your commandments, that you commanded to Moses, Saying, if you transgress, if you sin, if you forget my ways, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Israel did sin. God did scatter them. But here's what Nehemiah was remembering in verse 9. But if you turn unto me, but if you turn unto me, and keep my commandments and do them through though they were of your, you cast out unto the uttermost parts of the heavens. Yet will I gather them from the, from thence and will bring you unto the place I have chosen for you to be. Let me paraphrase that just a little bit. If you sin, it's going to cost you. You know what the trouble with sin is? Well, I know you know it. It's a lot of troubles with sin. But sin does really three things. One, it takes you further than you ever intended to go. Secondly, it costs you more than you ever intended to pay. Thirdly, it robs you of a relationship with God. That's what he does. 
That's what it does. That's why, that's why it's great that we're saved by grace. And it's why that when we recognize that, then we are going to recognize our sins and we're going to confess them before God. God was saying to Israel, God is saying to Hillsford Church today, that, that you, although you have gone away from where I want you to be, I'm going to let you do that until one day when you're ready, I will bring you back to where I want you to be. You've heard me use the prodigal son uh, a number of times, and, he, and that's exactly what he did with him. That's exactly what he did with, 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 uh, with Emma Harris's son, too. He let him go where he wanted to go, and then he brought him back where he wanted him to be. That's what God does. That was Nehemiah's God. He understood his God. He loved his God, and he knew his God loved him as well. Let's get into these outlines very quickly. Number one, we're talking about God taking care of Nehemiah's dilemma, and we're talking about God will take care of your and my dilemma too if we let him do it on his terms. On his terms. Number one, we must recognize the need. Dilemmas are not fun. They hurt. They discourage. And sometimes they defeat. Sometimes they defeat. Recognizing the need, and Nehemiah did that. He recognized the need. And when the people come and talk with him about what was going on, he wept very bitterly over that. My friends, whatever your dilemma might be, recognize the need of working with that dilemma and turning it over to the only dilemma solver, and that's none other than God himself. None other than God himself. Secondly, Nehemiah accepted personal responsibility. We've already talked about this a little bit, but he could have said, no, I'll be praying for you. I'll put you on my prayer list. And that's about all I can do now. Came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Thirdly, seek God for the solution. Seek God for that solution. Nehemiah did just that. He went to God. He talked to God about solving his problem. And in Nehemiah 5, 11, 5 through 11, I'm not going to read those, but, but you might want to read those for your devotions or something. But it was there that Nehemiah prayed to God. He confessed his sins. He, he confessed sins for Israel. And he reminded God that you have promised us something. The first has come to pass. We have been scattered abroad. Now the second has not come to pass. But you said, on your timing, you will bring us back to our land. He reminded he reminded God of that. He wasn't saying, God, you haven't done what you said. He wasn't saying that at all. He just reminded him that God had said this, and he knows, he knows for sure that if God has scattered them, God said, I'll bring them back. I will bring them back. So Nehemiah sought out that solution uh, from God, prayed to God that God would work them through this. Now, let me just ask you, what is your dilemma today? What is your dilemma today? Is it something that, that is distracting you from, from being all that God calls you to be? All that God calls you to be. You've heard me say this a million times, and I don't apologize for being repetitive, but every person in the house, God has called you, and he has a plan for your life. Every person in the house. Here, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, was not a priest Nehemiah was a lay person. What is a lay person? I know you know, but I'm just going to remind you. A lay person is someone that don't get paid to do what they do. They love what they do. And God is going to, God is going to pay them in time to come. Well, he's already paying us through blessing us. Nehemiah wasn't paid to do what he was going to the king and asking if he could go back and do. No, he was doing that because his heart was heavy. He loved his people. He loved his church. And he wanted to make sure that it was all that God intended it to be. Let me challenge you. Pray for your church regularly. 
Pray for your pastors regularly. Pray for each other regularly. Because you see, we're in this together. It's not one of us, it's all of us. We are in this together. Nehemiah sought God for a solution. Let me tell you, let me show you just five things quickly that was in that prayer. And you may want to incorporate this into your prayer time. Nehemiah was concerned about the problem. You know, when we just tell somebody that I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it, but I'll be praying for you. Sometimes that comes out as no concern whatsoever. And I know sometimes it does. I understand that. So be concerned about your problem. And number two, be convicted about the character of God. God said, said that I'll take you in if you, if you disobey. Me. He did that. Now Nehemiah was reminding him that, but you said you'd bring us back when you were through sifting us. And he did that. Be convicted. Confess your sins. Confess your sins to God. Let him know often he wants to hear from you. Have confidence in God's promise. And that's what we just talked about here. And number five, be committed to get involved. Nehemiah asked uh, ask his his. Uh, King Artaxerxes, uh, you know, if he could go back. And he not only gave him permission to go back, he even made him a governor. He even wrote letters to those people along the way that they were to help him when he passed through their territory. And then he even, he even, he even told them, he even told the, the, the uh, uh, I guess the sawmill man to make sure that you cut him whatever he needs when he's restoring the gates and the walls. You cut him whatever timber he needs. You see, God uses people in order to carry out his will. And he uses us. He used Nehemiah to go back, but he used other people to give Nehemiah what he needed to do what he needed to do. We're all important to God. We're all important to God. Don't ever, don't ever forget that. Are the walls in our lives that need to be rebuilt? There may not be. That's good if they're not, but there may be. What about our neighbors? Are we loving them as we should? What about our little squabbles? Are we straightening them out as we should? What about families? Are they strong as they should be? Or is there some walls that need to be built back up? Walls of love, walls of compassion, walls of concern needs to be built back up. I don't know. I'm just, just throwing that out. Can God trust us to rebuild those walls? Can God trust Hills Forward? Listen, can God trust Hills Forward to rebuild the walls that needs to be rebuilt in order that we might be unified? That we might be, and this just goes with that word, sanctified. Sanctified carries a little bit of holiness along with it. But it's not a one-time event. It's a journey. We're saved by that grace. And then we are sanctified as we mature in our walk with Christ until one day when we reach the top of that sanctification, then we're glorified. Nobody here is glorified. I'll tell you why. That happens when we step out of these old sinful bodies. That's when we're glorified in the presence of an awesome God. Can God trust us? Can God trust us to do what he's called us and placed us here to do? Can we remove those obstacles that distract us from God? Can we get those out of the way and move forward for God? Nehemiah did. And you know what I believe Nehemiah would say if he could talk to us today? You can too. You can too. Father, thank you again for our time together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Times like these, I often revisit a scripture in Romans, the 8th chapter. And... It says that, it, it says that, that uh, all things work together to the good of them that love the Lord and those that are called according to his purpose.